We are um, going to be doing a lot of Psalms tonight, so buckle up again. <laughs> this is another one of those nights where we're going to kind of overview some of them, go through a couple of them. Um, so we're, we're going to be uh, moving right along through the book of Psalms. But much of the Psalms were written in a time of David's life where he was running from King Saul. If you know anything about the story of David, you know that he Saul for 10 years um, after David was anointed king, right? God had already anointed David king. And then for 10 years after that, Saul chases David and is trying to kill him that entire time. And he's always having to flee here and go there and all of these things, even though God had already promised that he was going to give him the kingdom and he eventually would, but still it was this 10 year period. So every day David is having to rely on the Lord for protection, for provision, for where he should go next, for wisdom, all of those things. And many, many of the Psalms are written during this time um, of difficulty in David's life, which is why you and I can so easily identify oftentimes with the Psalms because, you know, life is hard sometimes, right? Um, but in the Psalms, you see David over and over, even though life was hard for him a lot of his life, you see the theme of so many songs always either starts or comes back to the fact that God is good. Because God is good all the time. And what? All, all the time. time God, God is good. good. And he's always talking about how big and how awesome God is. And how God's his protector and his refuge. And so even in the midst of these times when life is hard for him, he's always remembering who God is. And what God, you know, thinks about him. And how God's protected him and taken care of him. That's always a big theme of, of the way he's writing. So Psalm 9 is where we're ready for today. We made it through Psalm 8 last week. So Psalm 9, this, um, if you look at the title there, it says to the chief musician, to the tune of death of the son, a Psalm of David. This is a, thought by a lot of people to have been the Psalm that David wrote after his son with Bathsheba had died. So um, a lot of people feel like that's this time of his life when he's writing this Psalm. But we'll begin in verse number one. It says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all of your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. I love this because it's death of the son, right? I mean, can't imagine too many things harder than losing your son. Um, and yet, at the very beginning, here is David once again, as he does many, many times throughout the Psalms, making these amazing declarations. I will praise you. I will tell of your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice. I will sing praise to your name because praise is such a powerful tool for us, especially when we're going through hard times, when, when we're grieving or anxious or whatever the case may be. Praise is a powerful tool to lift your eyes above the situation and put them back on the Lord. And David understood this in his life. And I want to tell you, for me in my own personal life, Praise is a huge part of my daily life, especially when I'm stressed out or when I'm going through something. Man, I put on praise music and it just like, you know, I choose to praise the Lord in that time and it quiets my mind. It refocuses my heart on where it needs to be. And that's David saying, I will praise the Lord, even though I'm going through this hard thing, I will make these decisions to still praise the Lord in spite of it. And he ends verse two there and he says, oh, most high. That title literally means God over all. That's literally what he's calling God. He said, oh God over all. And I love that because you know what? When we keep that in mind that God is over everything, he's over every circumstance, every situation, every, you know, hurt, every, everything. God is over it all. It does put things in perspective. You know, when I, when I begin to think of that, that over every circumstance in my life, God is over it all. In verses three through eight, I'm just going to kind of summarize it. Basically, you know, David is saying basically that God is going to judge the world righteously because David in these next couple of Psalms, actually, he's talking a lot about the injustice and the wicked and people that are, you know, I mean, and in, in his life, I'm sure it was very present, you know, all the people that were hunting him for no reason, right? He was righteous and Saul was not and all of these kind of things, you know, but this whole like next little section here is basically just saying that God is going to judge the world in righteousness. That things, things may seem upside down right now, um, but that God is going to judge the world in righteousness and he's going to judge the wicked and uphold the righteous is what he says there multiple times in that little section. In verse number nine, he says, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed a refuge in times of trouble and those who know your name will put their trust in you for you lord have not forsaken those who seek you 
I love this because he says, the Lord is my refuge. We'll see that phrase so many times through the book of Psalms. He says it over and over and over, but that word refuge, it literally means a high tower or a lofty and or inaccessible place or a retreat. And when you think of the Lord that way, this refuge, a high tower, it says, you know, this lofty, inaccessible place that, you know what, when the Lord, when we're with him, we're in this place where the world can't touch us, right? The world can't hurt us when we're making our refuge in the Lord. And that's what he's saying here, that he's this high tower that he could run to. And he did find that his safe spot, his safe place was in the refuge of the Lord. And he would run to him for that help. In Psalm 46, it's a verse we all probably know and love, um, but in Psalm 46 in verse one and two, he says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be tr troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. And when you think about this high tower, you think about what David's describing here, the mountains are falling, the waves are crashing. I mean, you just think of all the circumstances in life that feel so chaotic. And yet David imagines himself in this high tower safe with the Lord, even though the world around him may be falling apart. And that is so true in our lives. The whole world can be falling apart around us or feel like that. But if our refuge is in the Lord, we know that we are safe with him in that high tower that he provides for us in his presence. And then in verse 11 through 20, I'm not going to read the rest of the Psalm to you, but basically he's assured that God is working on his behalf and that God is going to take care of his enemies. And does God work on his behalf and take care of his enemies? Yes, he does. There were so many times in King David's life where it looked like there was no way out. He's surrounded on every side. You know, Saul has him way outnumbered. And yet then all of a sudden, the last minute, God just provides this miraculous way of escape. And Saul has to go fight another army or something like that happens. And so he's recounting how God is always working on his behalf and has rescued him in every situation that felt impossible. It goes on in Psalm number 10. And uh, the, he starts this psalm with why do you stand afar off, O Lord? I'll just read, read it to you really quick, the whole psalm. It says, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Actually, I'm not gonna read it, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm gonna back on up for just a second. Um, just because I, I, I am gonna try to get to a couple other ones that we're gonna go into more in detail. But this one, basically, when he starts off with, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? And why do you hide in times of trouble? You ever feel like that? You know, where the Lord's distant from you or you, you feel like all these things are going wrong and where is the Lord and all of that. And for David in this Psalm, he really is seeing the evil and the injustice in the world. That's what this whole Psalm is about, is the evil and injustice that is going on all around him. He's going, Lord, where are you? You know, and I don't know about you, like watch the news. You can kind of feel that way, right? Like there's so much, I mean, just evil that is abounding in in our world and all of these things are so upside down and right is considered wrong right and wrong is considered right and and you just look at this and you say lord like why are you so far away why are you standing far you know like why aren't you intervening in this when all this crazy stuff is happening but the truth is god does see you know that's that's the truth is that a lot of people mistake god's long suffering for blindness it's not a matter that god does not see God is very capable of seeing, and he does see every single thing that's happening on the earth. But the truth is, God is long-suffering that none should perish. That's what the Bible tells us. It's not that he can't see or that he won't act. He is acting. He is moving. He is working. There will come a day, right, where he's going to rule and reign in righteousness and justice. But the reality of it is he is still very long-suffering. There's a lot of lost people, and there's still time for those people to come to know Christ, right? Which is why he's given all of us the Great Commission, to be light and salt in this world, because there's still a whole lot of lost people that he wants to see come to heaven that are currently on the road to hell. So he's very long-suffering, not wishing that any should perish. But this tune kind of changes towards the end of the psalm as he's kind of going you know, on about you know, these injustices and stuff. In verse 14, he says, But you have seen... For you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, 
and the man of the, uh, of the earth may oppress no more. And so he starts out some saying, Lord, where are you? But then he ends the psalm quickly by coming back to the realization, like, you do see. You are working. You will act. You are helping the fatherless. You're working in these situations. You are fair and just. And you do hear and you do um, listen to our cries as we're crying out to you about this injustice that is happening around us. In Psalm number 11, it goes on and it says, um, it starts out in Psalm 11 and he says, in the Lord, I put my trust. That's a great way to start a prayer. Just so you know, in the Lord, I put my trust. But if we kind of jump down to verse five, it says, the Lord tests the righteous. Is that not true? You know, some people have this idea that, you know, once I become a Christian, life's just going to be all sunshine and rainbows, you know? Um, I hate to break the news to you. That is not, <laughs> not the case, right? You know, the truth is that, you know, there are times where God allows our faith to be tested. We studied this in great detail in 1 Peter. And the idea with allowing our faith to be, faith to be tested is to do what? Does anybody remember the theme of 1 Peter? Well, and grow up, right? Yeah. Grow up, mature. That's the whole idea of First Peter. Because the reality of it is that if your faith is never tested, your faith will remain weak, right? If you never have to trust God for anything in your life and everything's always sunshine and rainbows, then you have no need for faith in your life and you become a very weak Christian, right? And so God does sometimes allow testing in our life, but First Peter tells us why he allows those things. And I want to read it to you. To remind you, in First Peter chapter 1, it says this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And our trials in this life are various, right? Some last longer, some last shorter, some are more intense than others. We do get grieved by various trials. And then he tells us the reason, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So why does he allow believers to get their faith tested? Is it so that you'll, you know, fail the test and, you know, not, not uh, succeed? Is that why? No, he says that he allows us to go through these various trials to test our faith so that we will become more precious. That faith that we have becomes like a precious metal, right? What happens to metal? That because How do you get metal more precious, right? You turn up the heat. You heat it up, and the more that you heat that metal, the more junk you can scrape off the top, and the more that you do that, the more precious that metal becomes, and the more valuable it is. It is a, I mean, a common analogy through the Bible, but such a great one for us to think about our own Christian lives. Sometimes God does allow that heat to get turned up a little bit in our lives, because it's during those times, first of all, that some scum comes to the top, right? We see where we're still weak. We see, we see where we still doubt, you know, where we still, you know, have troubles trusting, um, but also he's always faithful. That's the thing that God is always in control of how long he leaves you in the fire and what kind of fire it is and all of those things, because his goal is not to burn you up. And so he's never going to let you get, you know, hotter than what he has intended for you in that moment. And so for us, when we trust that, and, and the reality is when you look back at your Christian walk, you can see all these various trials that you've had to go through in the past whether they be financial or marriage struggles or trouble with your kids or whatever the case may be. And you can look back and you can see, oh gosh, God was so faithful then. And he was so faithful then. And he's so faithful now. And it, it builds our faith because we know that in this current trial that I'm in right now, God is also going to be faithful, even though he's allowing me to be tried at this particular moment, but it's not to hurt me. It is to purify me. It is to make me more precious and my faith more real and more genuine in him in verse number seven he says for the lord is righteous and he loves righteousness his countenance beholds the upright he loves and he sees you even in your seasons of testings i love that because he says you know his countenance is what be is what upholds the upright that even in those times of trials that he sees you he cares about you and he is upholding you even in that moment of trial in your life. In Psalm number 12, he starts off here, help Lord. <laughs> you ever just said that prayer? Uh, you know, it's one of the most effective short prayers you can say. And I've prayed it many times in my life. Help Lord. You're like you don't even know really where to start or what to pray. It's just help Lord. And that's okay. You can pray that way. Help Lord is a great prayer and a good way 
to start your your prayer life. I'll let you guys read 12 on your own. We're not going to go too much into it. Just know that it is okay. You know, you can be like David and that you learned your, your prayer life from David. Help, Lord. <laughs> if you're feeling that that way tonight, just pray that very simple prayer. In Psalm 13, in verse number one, it says, how long, O Lord, will, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. He starts off, I love how David always kind of starts off one way and ends the other way, right? Kind of oftentimes starts out in this low point, but ends by the time the song's over at a high point. Here he's saying, how long, oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Anybody ever felt like that with trials that they're going through in their life? Like this is a trial that has been going on for years or months or however long it has been. Some trials, you know, we feel like that about them. Like how long, oh Lord, am I going to have to go through the same thing? And we're still here and I'm still dealing with the same struggles I've been dealing with for all of these years. How long, oh Lord, we can all, you know, relate to this feeling that David is having because sometimes, you know, the Bible says it came to pass and sometimes we feel like it came to stay <laughs> because the same thing is not going to go away. And that's how David's feeling at this moment. And you think about David's testimony, right? 10 years. After he was anointed king, he had to run for his life every day. That's a long time. Ten years is a long time to live in caves, to not have a home, to not be with your family. That's a long time. But even after he became king, seven more years before he actually became king over all of Israel. For seven years, he was only king of one tribe. So, I mean, it's it, 17 years he had to wait to see the fulfillment of of God's promise that he had given to him 17 years earlier. That's a long time. I mean, I can imagine he had many days feeling this. How long, oh Lord? I mean, you anoint me king, and yet I'm still running, and I'm still living in these caves. How long, oh Lord? And yet we see how his, his end resolve there, even though he may have started the psalm feeling like, how long, oh Lord? What does he say in verse number five? But I have trusted in your mercy. This is a decision that David made that no matter what, he knew God was going to be faithful to the promise that he gave him. Even though it was 17 years after the fact, he's trusting in the Lord's mercy in his life. And he says, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Another decision that he's making. He says, I will sing to the Lord. Why? Because he has dealt bountifully with me. And the truth is, if we're all really serious and we all really start to think about how bountifully the Lord deals with us on a daily basis, we have lots to be grateful for. Yes, there are things in our lives that are hard. Yes, there are trials that we've been going through for a long time. My son is in Peru right now and he, he sent me a video, you know, just like driving down the street. And I'm like, immediately made me so thankful that I live in the United States of America, first of all. The fact that you have a house and food and a car to drive and there's not trash heaps literally right there. And I'm talking house upon house. You know, like that's a little thing, right? But I'm just saying that the Lord has dealt very bountifully with us in so many ways. And even though David's life wasn't exactly where he wanted it to be, right? He, he could recognize that God's blessing was on his life, even in those times where it felt like it was taking God a long time to do what he said he was going to do. You know, he remembered God's bountiful provision. You know, you look at Paul and Silas, right? You know, they're beaten for going where God told them to go and preach the gospel. They're thrown into prison. They're locked into stocks. And yet it says at midnight, what are they doing? Praising, Praising and singing God, right? They could have been feeling very sorry for themselves at that moment and saying, Lord, why would you allow me to go through this? I went where you told me to go. I'm doing what you called me to do, which is preach the gospel. And you let these people put stripes on my back, lock me in these stocks. And now I'm in the inner cell. I mean, this would be me. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm giving you my, this would, this would be what I'd be saying at midnight. And yet Paul and Silas are not doing that. They're cho they chose, right? To sing and praise the Lord. And it changed the entire scenario for them, right? People got saved. They did a work in this prison. It was it was an amazing thing that would not have happened had they not made a decision 
to praise the Lord for how he deals bountifully with us, even in those times of struggle in our life. In Psalm number 14, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I'm going to read to you out of Romans, kind of says the, the same thing. Um, in Romans chapter 1, beginning of verse number 18, it says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools. Basically what Romans chapter 1 says is there is no such thing as an atheist, right? That every person makes a choice. And literally, if you look at the wording of this, it says, the fool has said in his heart, and you see how there is is in italics? That means it's not really there. They added that to try to help make it make more sense to us. But if you read it the way it really was written, the fool has said in his heart, no God. Not that there is no God, just no God. Because really, that is true. God <laughs> says that every man will be without excuse when he stands before the Lord because he's written his very law in your heart and he's written his very existence in creation. He said every single person is born with the knowledge that there is a God which is why every man will be without excuse. So when you're talking to somebody who is an atheist, it's not because of a lack of knowledge or a lack of logic, you know, to be able to argue with someone the existence of God. Because here's the truth. Like uh, an infinite being cannot be proven to exist by a finite being. But the exact opposite can be true, right? An infinite being can also not be disproven by a finite being. They cannot prove there is no God. You cannot prove that there is God. Yet God said, I wrote it in their heart. I've written it in the sky. There is visible evidence, he says, all over the place that there is a God. And so just as you have chosen to put your faith in God, they have chosen in their life to say no God. Why? Because they don't think that there was a creator who created all this stuff? No. Because they don't want accountability, right? Mm -hmm. The reality is that there's no, there's no point in arguing head knowledge with an atheist or an agnostic because that's not the problem. The problem is a heart problem, not a head <coughs> problem. They have sin in their life. It turn, it, it, it's rebellion against God at the end of the day, right? And they don't want to <coughs> deal with that. So you don't have to deal with the head. you got to deal with the heart. That's what God deals with, right? So the whole heart problem with saying there is no God is that they, they won't acknowledge him. That's what Romans says. It's that, that I clearly am known, and yet they willfully choose not to believe it. And professing to be wise, which so many of these people do, right? I mean, they make themselves sound so fancy and special, and they have all kinds of letters after their name and all of these things, but it says, in reality, they are fools. Because I, I my evidence is seen everywhere that I do exist, that I am real. It goes on um, in verse... Um, Sorry, give me just a second. Um, I'm just going to kind of summarize 2 through 7. You guys can read the rest of it. Um, but in, in verse 7, I'll kind of highlight it there. It says, there is none who does good, no, not one. Um, just kind of want to highlight there because that is quoted in Romans chapter 3 by Paul. Um, so Paul quotes that same verse there in Romans chapter 3 when he goes on in that same chapter to say, for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so the reality is not only is there a God, but we all need him in our lives, right? Because we cannot be justified by ourselves, right? We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And therefore we all need Jesus and we all need a savior. And so that's essentially what David is saying here and what Paul kind of elaborates on in Romans chapter three. And in verse seven, he ends this, this chapter by saying, oh, that salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. Did salvation come out of Zion? <laughs> yes, it did. And what was his name? Jesus, Jesus right? Jesus is, is you know, the, the solution to our sin problem, right? Although we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but Jesus, right, who is rich in mercy, right, came and died and, and took our place. 
and forgave us of our sins. And that salvation did, in fact, come out of Zion. It goes on in, in Psalm 15. Um, in verse number one, it says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. But he honors those who fear the Lord, and he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not pour out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. This Psalm, Psalm 15, is written at a time when um, David had, if you remember, David had a heart to bring the Ark of God back to Jerusalem. Um, and they have this big party where they're going to go get the Ark of God. And they're going to, the tabernacle is now set up in Jerusalem. And they are going to bring the Ark of God back into the tabernacle in Jerusalem where it belonged. And so David sends this party to go get it. They put the ark on a cart led by oxen. And at one point in time, they come across a part where it like kind of the oxen stumble. And one of the men who was walking alongside of the cart put his hand out to stabilize the ark and touch the ark and he died, right? And David, if you remember, left the ark right there. And he just was like, I don't even know what to do. Like, the, you know, like, I don't understand God. You just, you killed Uzzah and he just touched the ark. But the truth is, this is written like three months after that incident happened. And, and I have a feeling that David had done a lot of grappling with the Lord when he says, who may abide in your tabernacle and who may dwell in your holy hill? Because he had just seen the Lord, you know, do this, this thing with Uzzah. But the truth is that in that whole scenario, God had clearly prescribed in his word the way the ark was to be moved. It had holes inside and a rings and it had poles that were supposed to be inserted through those rings and it was supposed to be carried by the priests it was not supposed to be put on a cart nor was it supposed to be you know um led by oxen so he it's not that you can just the holy things of god just do however you want to do it it's fine you know as long as you're doing something like you hear that all the time today do you not like you can just kind of make up your own religion you're just gonna make up your own rules no, this is not how it works. God has a prescribed way of holiness. And in this particular situation, he had a prescribed way that the ark was to be moved. And guess what would happen? They would recollect themselves. They would get the priests. They would get the poles. And they would move it correctly the next time. And everything was fine, right? Because there was a certain way that they were supposed to do this. But God's prescribed a way for us Christians, right? And he's saying here, he who walks uprightly, works righteousness, speaks the truth, does not backbite does no evil to his neighbor, doesn't use usury. You know, he lists all these things because here's the truth, that God has a prescribed way for us as Christians to walk, to talk, and to live. You know, you have a lot of people who profess to be Christians and then live any old way that they want. God does demand right living. That is, it's not okay for Christians. I mean, all Christians sin and fall short of the glory of God. We know that. I mean, none of us in this room are sinless, right? And we're all very grateful for the grace of God. But God does make a distinction. You as a believer are not to be practicing sin in your life. You are to live righteously. That is right with God and right with your neighbor, right? That you're doing the things that he's laid out in his word and that you're walking uprightly. And like I said, that doesn't mean perfectly because we all blow it. But the word literally me is tamim in the Hebrew and it means moral integrity. That he wants you living your life as a Christian with moral integrity integrity and it's like you know when a baby's learning how to walk right this is instructions on how we're to walk as a believer when a baby's first learning how to walk you expect them to fall quite often right they're a little wobbly they fall down a lot it's the same way with christians right i mean brand new baby christians they're learning how to walk they don't even know what god's word says right so we're not expecting them to walk like you know to walk perfect because they're babies right but if you're not a baby, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, God does expect that the longer that you walk with him, the more you know his word, the more that you grow in him, the better that you walk. Not that you'll ever do it perfectly, but if you've been a Christian a long, long time and you're stumbling all the time, all the time, all the time, it's like, why are you not growing up? You know, you should be walking 
differently by now the, the closer that you get to the Lord and the more that you know what his word says and so that's the goal right we want to be Christians who not that we'll never stumble you will as a Christian stumble but when we do stumble we're quick to repent right we're quick to get right with the Lord I mean we all blow it but we don't want to live in sin practicing sin right when I do make a mistake or I say something I shouldn't have said or I do something I shouldn't have that that is my heart that I'm very quick to get back right with the Lord and say, Lord, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. You know, I blew it. That That's going to happen, right? But that we are living in this right with God, you know, place where there's nothing because sin hinders your relationship with the Lord. That's just the bottom line. If you're practicing sin in your life, you're not going to want to read your Bible that day. You know, you're not going to want to pray that day. You're pro you know, you may not come to church that weekend, you know, and, and things like that. So we don't want those things in between us and the Lord. We want to have this right relationship where we're quick to get righteous with him. It goes on, it says in verse or in, uh, chapter 16, it says uh, a Mitchum of David. Um, th there's several Psalms that are listed as a Mitchum of David. What the difference is, nobody really knows. I read a whole bunch on it. Some people think it means golden, some whatever. So, you know, we don't know. <laughs> Why he la la labeled this as a Mitchum? Well, you, if you find out, let me know. <laughs> But it says here at, in verse one, it says, preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. And so this is a cry for preservation, obviously, again, with the theme of him running from Saul and having to rely on the Lord every day. It's interesting because he's going to start this prayer off a bit panicked, but he's going to end it in peace. And I, like I said, I do love this progression through the Psalms. You know, he goes from being very concerned at the beginning to confidence in God at the end. He goes from looking at his very temporary situation at the moment, at the beginning, to his eternal situation with the Lord at the end. And so we're going to see this kind of like progression go through the psalm where he's panicked to peace, where he's very concerned to where he's confident in the Lord's ability to help him, where he is very consumed with what's going on right now to having peace in the eternal that God has for him in store. And so um, it says here at the end, I'm, I'll, I'll read the last verse so you can see where we're going and then we'll get into it verse by verse. It says, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's kind of where he's going to end up. And he says, in your presence is fullness of joy. So he starts out, help now, Lord, preserve me, help me. And then he ends with saying, in your presence is fullness of joy. And so this is an outline for us, how to have joy and peace and hope in eternity. Anybody else need a little joy and peace and hope in their life, right? We need more of these things in our lives. So as we kind of walk through this, it gives us some real keys on how to have this joy and the peace and the hope that we have in Jesus. It goes on, it says in verse number two, Oh my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my God. My goodness is nothing apart from you. I love how he starts in verse two because he says, you are my Lord. It's a very personal word. You are my Lord. You always know, or I always know when someone doesn't really know Jesus, when they talk about him in very impersonal terms, he's the savior. He's whatever. I'm like, he's, he's my savior. He is my Lord. He is my God, right? He is personal to me. And here is David saying at the very beginning of this, Lord, help me. I am putting my trust in you. And then he says, but you are my God, my very personal God. And then he says here, you are my Lord. Again, that word Lord is that title that he used. We studied it last week. That literally means master, right? That he is your Lord. And it is so good to start our prayers off by submitting to your Lord, right? And to his sovereignty, because if he is Lord, he is above me, right? He is bigger than me. He is sovereign over me. And when I can start off by praying and saying, Lord, you are my Lord. You are in charge of every thought, every action, every problem, every anxiety, every situation in my life. Lord, you are over it all. There is such an amazing piece. I had to do, it, so, it just so happened to be, right? I always say that because it's, it's such a joke. God does it, right? But I'm studying this and I just listened to this amazing teaching on this. And, and that, like that's when my whole Monday kind of went nuts. And I 
was laying in bed and I just, I was just, you know, I was on one and I just was laying there just like about a lot of different things. That's not the only thing going on in my life. It's one, you know? And I'm like, the Lord, I brought this like whole pattern back to my mind as I was laying there reminding me what I had just studied. But I did just start to like, just give it all to the Lord. I was just laying there. I'm like, and this, and this, and this, and like, have it all. You're in control. You know, if I'm going to get this job, you know, if I'm going to even like this job, you know, if this is a job, you know, and then I started praying about all the other areas of my life that I'm trying to control because I'm a control freak. And I started just giving them all. To, and it was amazing within a minute. I'm not kidding you a minute. I already felt so much lighter. I already felt so much better when I just went back to just allowing God to be sovereign in my life. And you know what happened to be in our daily Bible reading that day? I don't know if you guys read it or not, but it says he knows the beginning from the end. And he brought that back to my, I, I told you I've been taking pictures, right? I'm like, so I'm laying in bed and I was starting and I'm like, okay, I'm going to read back through my daily stuff. That just happened to be one of the things I took a picture of that day was he knows the end from the beginning. And I was just like, Lord. You are so much bigger than all of this. You know the end from the beginning. Why am I even stressing about this? You know where I'm supposed to be. You know what's going to happen. I have no idea. And I'm just going to let you do it. <laughs> you know? And it was like, and two minutes later, I'll take it back. You know, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but it felt really good for the time just to let it go. So I just want to encourage you guys. Those things. Let him be sovereign. Surrender those things that worry you, that you're trying to control, that are stressing you out. Whatever it is that are bumming you out. Remember, he's Lord. He's over it. He's Lord over all. And he's got this. And he's in control. And he's big. Right? That's what I gotta remember. He's in control. And I'm not. And he's way big. And he knows the beginning from the end. <clears throat> it goes on. It says in verse 3. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. I just kind of want to point that out. Like, do we delight in the saints? Like, that's you. That's us. Right? That's believers. And I just thought... I thought that David pointed that out saying like, I just delight in fellow believers, you know? And can you imagine like David has all these enemies coming from all these different sides, but he had those saints that were faithful, you know, to the Lord and to him. And, you know, they were just a delight to his soul. And I thought, I, I, that's why I love Tuesday nights. I, I feel like that. You know, I feel like there, you guys are also to delight to our soul. When we come to church, it should be that way. We delight in the saints. We delight in fellowship with one another and encouraging one another. And it goes on in verse number four, it says, their sorrow shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. And so idolatry was a huge issue for the nation of Israel. Obviously, they ended up going in captivity over it. Um, God judged them many times because of it. But here's basically David just saying, hey, nothing. I'm never going to have these false gods' names on my lips, nor am I ever going to serve them. I will serve you and you alone and you number one. And for us in our lives, we think of idolatry and we think it's, I mean, I think we kind of sometimes think it's silly because we think of like a little carved image and you're like, well, I would never bow down to that, you know, but it's anything that takes your number one place in your life. Anything that takes the place of the Lord in your life. It could be a hobby. Um, it could be your job. It could be your children. It could be a lot of things that take that first place in your life before the Lord. And if anything takes the place before the Lord, it's an idol in your life, right? And, and here's David saying, nothing is going to come before the Lord. It's the Lord first and then everything else, right? As it should be in our lives. And we do have to constantly be evaluating our lives. Is he the number one spot in my life? Like, does he get my first time, my first attention? Like, or is it all these other things? Because if so, maybe I need to do some reprioritizing here. And so David just making this commitment um, that his relationship with the Lord was the number one important thing in his life. It goes on, it says in verse number five, O oh Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. And so next, the, the pathway to peace and joy, he says here, he says he's okay and he's grateful with the lot, which means the portion assigned to him that God has given him. I think for us in our life, this is huge because I think a lot of people lack joy and peace in their life because they do not like the lot that they feel like God has assigned to them. And they kind of live their life in this if only kind of place. If only I had a different job. If only I had a different spouse. If only my kids acted like her kids. If only I was married. If only kind of always just living in this spot where we're never really thankful 
for where we are right now. For, and, and law is not a bad thing. It's the portion that God's given you. That's literally what the word law means. So being content and being grateful for the portion that God has given to us. And I'll tell you, gratefulness is a huge pathway to peace in your life and to joy. You want to be miserable? Just sit there all day long and think about things you don't have and that aren't the way you want them. There's everybody in this room could come up with a whole list of things that they wish were different in their lives and only if and all of these things. It's a great way to be really miserable is to sit around and think about all those things all day long. And, the, you know, it's, it's interesting how this works because there could be one thing in your life that's just really hard, you know, that you do wish was different, you know, and you pray is different. And that's okay. I can pray for situations in my life that I don't like, right? I can ask God to move in this situation and help this person or to make this different. There's nothing wrong with me praying that. But if my whole focus is just always on that, you know, say it is your marriage. Let's just use that as an example. Your marriage is tough, you know? And so every day, that's all you think about is how hard this is and how hard this is. And yet you're not thinking about all the many things that are great in your life. Your kids are healthy. You have a job, you know, whatever the case may be. It's amazing when you shift your focus off that thing, whatever that thing may be, and it's different for every person that you don't like in your life right now, or that is hard in your life right now. And you begin to just thank God for all the great things in your life that joy will start to come. You will start to experience the joy of the Lord when you practice this attitude of gratitude where you're saying, Lord, you know what? You know about this, but actually what I wanna to talk to you about is all these other things, right? That you have done, that you will do, that you've done in the past, the goodness that you've shown me, the lot that you've given me. And choosing to be content because we, we want to be content where the Lord has us right now, regardless of where that is, right? I mean, Paul said that, right? I'm going to read it to you in Philippians. And Philippians is a book about what? Joy. The whole book of Philippians is about joy. Over and over and over and over, you'll see joy, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. So here's a book about joy. And this is one of the things that Paul says in this book of joy. He says, not that I speak in regard to me, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So a key to joy, Paul is telling us in this book, is I have learned to be content. So contentment is something you and I can learn. Okay, if Paul says I learned how to do it, we can learn how to do it too. And I want to encourage us to be content with the portion that God has given you and grateful for those things because the truth is let's just say you your life is really hard to find things to be thankful in you can always be thankful in the Lord and what he has done for you and what he has given you the reality but if you're if you're struggling with this like I don't know what to be thankful for I want to encourage you to pre read Ephesians chapter 1 pray over Ephesians chapter 1 because it is a list of all of the blessings that God has given us as Christ followers it lists a whole bunch of things. I'm going to list some to you, but we can be thankful that he has given us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He chose us. You can be very thankful that God chose you, that he made us holy, right? We are not in and of ourselves holy. He made us holy, that he made us blameless, that he loves us, that he adopted us as daughters, that he extended grace to us and that he forgives us our sins and that he accepted us and that he has redeemed us all those things right that that's just a short list from Ephesians chapter 1 but if all else fails you can just begin to thank God for all that he's done for you in your life and forgiving you and redeeming you and choosing you and adopting you and creating a place right where there's no more crying and where there's no more suffering where he's going to take us which is the next kind of little uh, segment that we're going to see David kind of move on to here. It goes on in verse number seven. It says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel and my heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. He says here, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. We talked about this in Psalm one. Where are you supposed to get your counsel from? The Lord. And here's David saying, I will bless the Lord because he has given me counsel. Because here's the thing, when you need counsel in your life, is there any situations in your life right now currently that you need counsel on? Yes and amen, <laughs> right? 
Well, I want to tell you, go to him first, go to him often, go to him before anybody else. Why? Because he's the only one who has this title. He is your wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace, right? He's the only one who has that title of not just being a counselor, a wonderful counselor. He is your Prince of Peace. He is mighty God. So when you're getting counsel from somebody, that's a pretty dang good resume, okay? The wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace. Oh, and Everlasting Father. I skipped that one. Sorry. And it says, when you have the Lord as Lord over your life and you're submitting to him and you're putting him first in your life and he's your counselor, you will not be moved. That's what it says here. So no matter what's happening in your life, you're not going to be shaken. You're not going to be moved. And it says in verse number nine, therefore, what does therefore mean, right? It's since. In this, in this instance, it means since. Taking all of the things we've just been studying, all of the whole prior, you know, psalm into consideration. Since all of these things are true, he says, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. I love that phrase there because he says, therefore, since all of this is true, since the Lord is, is king in my life and I'm going to surrender all my junk to him. And since I have put him first in my life and nothing is going to come in between me and my relationship with him. And because my inheritance is in him and my lot has been given to me by him. Right. And because he is my wonderful counselor, he says here, therefore, my heart is glad and my flesh will rest in hope. My flesh will rest in hope. Like you can rest in hope. Now, this is not just like a hope that's going to come once you get to heaven, right? That someday you'll be able to rest. He says, my flesh, like right now, I'm going to be able to rest in hope in the Lord because of these things, because I put my trust in him. In verse number 10, it says, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy one to see corruption. This is actually a prophetic um, uh, verse here that David writes. We learn that in Acts chapter 2, um, which you don't have to turn there with me. I'll just quickly read it to you. But it, um, uh, Peter, in his first sermon that he preaches on the day of Pentecost, he quotes from, from this um, psalm here in Psalm 16. And he says, um, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. Sounding familiar to anybody? Yeah. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseen this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ and that his soul would, was, would not be left in Hades, nor his flesh see corruption. So it's saying here, David's dead and buried, right? Like his flesh did see corruption, but he's speaking of Jesus, right? He's speaking of the Messiah. And so this is a prophetic verse, Peter kind of outlining that there in Acts chapter 2. In verse number 11, it says, you will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So very different than the way he started this psalm, right? The way he's ending his psalm. But he is shifting his focus now to eternity, right? There's pleasures forevermore. I love how he words that. I, that was kind of a new phrase to talk about eternity that I, I kind of, you know, what came, you know, obviously, you know, in studying this. But pleasures forevermore. And for, for us, you know... Um, the Bible says, you know, he talks about here love and joy and peace, right? That he has and the hope and all of these good things. But, you know, the truth is for us, when we shift our perspective to heaven, it really does change things for us in our, in our daily struggles that we have here in this life. Because if this life is all we have, I mean, the Bible says, like, we of all people are most pitiable, right? But the truth is, the Bible does promise that nothing that you face on this side of glory will be worthy to be compared 
with the pleasures forevermore that he has waiting for you. And so all of this is temporary, right? Even when you're saying, oh Lord, how long? Like David did. In light of eternity, it's but for a moment. So even those things that maybe you'll struggle with from now until the day that you die, there is coming an end to the problem. There is coming an end to that thing, right? That That is, you know, bothering you in your life. Because there is a place, right? That this, where there's pleasures forevermore, where there's eternal peace and, and there's no more crying or sorrow or darkness or evil or all these things that we contend with here on this side. And then he says here, where is, where is his joyful? In verse number 11, in your presence is fullness of joy. And I want to tell you that's the truth. You're lacking joy in your life, spend some time with the Lord. You know, separate yourself. Make yourself get away with the Lord and just spend some time praising, reading the Bible, getting quiet with him, running to that high tower that is there waiting for you. Because here's the reality. Why is David known as a man after God's own heart? I mean, the guy blew it, right? Pretty bad. <laughs> he had some pretty major sins. And yet, when the New Testament talks about King David, it says he was a man after God's own heart. Why? Right here. This tells you. Because his joy was found in the presence of the Lord. And he spent a lot of time in the presence of the Lord, which is why he could have real funky starts to his songs and end on a high note, right? Which is why he could stay faithful to the Lord through all the running and all the hard things that he went through in his life because his joy was found in the presence of the Lord alone. And he ran there often and he spent a lot of time there because that's the truth where are you going to find joy in the presence of the lord when you're receiving counsel from your wonderful counselor the prince of peace who also is this mighty god who's bigger than whatever it is that you're going through and the truth is when i get the proper perspective that god is big right way bigger than any of my problems and that he knows best for my life and that he's allowed whatever it is into my life so that he can mature me and grow me up in him but I'm not going to have to do this forever. There's coming a day where every single thing that's hurting me, that is a problem for me, that I'm anxious about, it's going to end. And I get to spend eternity with Jesus in a place that's perfect. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much that there is a, a kind of an outline here for us to be able to experience your joy and your peace and your hope in our lives. Lord, I do pray that you know where each one of us are tonight, Lord. You know those struggles that we go through. You know the things in our lives that, that burden us, that stress us out, Lord, that we're kind of under tonight, Lord. I just pray that you would help us just to shift our perspective upwards, Lord, to who you are, that you are a mighty God, Lord, who is in control. And Lord, I pray that we would just surrender our hearts and our lives to you, Lord, that we would truly find our refuge in you, that we would run to you often, Lord, and, and in those times, Lord, where you will give us that joy and that peace and that hope that we need. And Lord, we do thank you for your abundant blessings in our lives, Lord, that you have redeemed our lives. You have saved us. Lord, you've forgiven us. And Lord, I do ask, um, Lord, that we would have an eternal perspective, Lord, that, that there's nothing that we're going to face in this earth that's worthy to be compared with eternity with you. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.